All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so let's pray and then we'll get into our session. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for this day, God. And Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together and just study your word again and, and learn about our identity that we have in you as your children of God. And even as we learn deeper in your word, Lord, we pray that you will minister to each of our hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us, O God, and help us to understand and to learn and to grasp the things of God into our hearts, into our spirit, O God, that will bear fruit in each of our lives. We thank you for doing this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So... We've done up to chapter 24 last class. Last class, we did quite a few topics. 22, we looked at how we are without blame before God. Uh, 23, chapter 23, we looked at how we are accepted in the beloved. What is the meaning of accepted? Remember, I gave that example when you wrote your application form, you were accepted, right? So the Lord Jesus is ex accepted us, has accepted us is ex accepting us even now into his presence. Then we look at chapter 24, that we are washed, sanctified, and justified in the presence of God. Right. So let's get into chapter 5. Now, again, as we get into this chapter, there could be uh, pointers that could be repeated. But wherever it's repeated, I'm just going to go quick so that uh, we can cover the entire portion. Right. So chapter 25. The righteousness of God. Before we go ahead, what is righteousness? You should know this by now. Come on, give me uh, some answers. What is righteousness? Pastor, right standing with God. Right standing with God. Okay. Oh, guys, those who are here, what is righteousness? We've been learning, no, all this while. Gertrude already gave the answer. Where we have a right standing with God. Right? And when we become believers, God imputes. The word imputes means he puts it on ourselves. Even if we say, God, I don't want righteousness, God says, you, you have to take it. Because it's part of becoming a believer. Right? Now, the righteousness that he is is what has been given to us. Now, when Jesus is standing, for example, right? I'm helping you to understand this. I'm painting a picture for you. When Jesus is standing in front of the Father, does he have a right standing before the Father? Yes or no? He has a right standing? Is the Father saying, no, I don't want you. You're not, uh, you're not the right person. Is the Father saying that? Is the Father saying you're sinful? Is he saying that? When the Father is looking at Jesus, does he have a right standing? That's why the Bible says Jesus stood, Jesus, after he resurrected, he went and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. Right? So just as how Jesus has a right standing before the Father, you and I, the same righteousness that's in Jesus is in you and me. So now, while going into God's presence, do we have to fear? Do we have to get scared? Oh, I did so many sins. Do we have to get scared? Yes or no? No, right? You can just go into God's presence with confidence. Right? Let's read these uh, couple of verses here. Romans 3.22. Uh, is there a mic here? Go ahead, read. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference. Yeah. I like this verse. For the righteousness of God through faith. Right? Through faith in Jesus Christ. So how can you and I have a right standing before God? Just 
the answer is only one thing. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so everyone say this after me. I receive the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, Not, not uh, five hours of prayer, five hours of worship, read the whole Bible. All of that is important. But we receive the righteousness of God through faith. All we have to do is believe. Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you believe in Jesus Christ? All of us believe in Jesus. So are we the righteousness of God? Right? Let's read 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and mm. redemption. So it says here, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God. So, but of him, talking about the Father, you and I are in Christ Jesus. Yes, because you and I are in Christ Jesus, we receive righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. I'll read the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Right? There's, a, there's this saying called the great exchange. Right? And we talked about it in the initial chapters. The great exchange is nothing but God who knew no sin, took up sin for us, so that we who are sinful can become the righteousness of God. The one who wasn't sinful became sin and those who are sinful became holy you understand that let me repeat it see god is holy but he became sin for us and we are sinful but we become holy because of what jesus did it's called the great exchange right here christ became sin for us for our sake so that you and I can go before the Father. Right? The righteousness of God has been imparted to all of us. The righteousness we have has, has been given, that we have been given, is the righteousness of God. And when we try to understand this, we may not understand. But we receive it by faith. Okay? If you think, hey, how do I have a right standing before God? I don't have a right standing before God. Remember in the Old Testament? Do they, were they fearful to go into the temple? Very scared. Oh, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, this great big God. How can I enter his presence? There was this fear. Right? Because God is so big, so holy, so great. Miracle working God. He did these great miracles. And now I am going into his presence. No, no. But in the New Testament, when Jesus was on the cross, that veil was torn. That means what? The separation was removed. So now when we get into God's presence, there should not be any fear. We, there should not be any doubt whether God will listen to us or not whether God loves us or not. There should not be any doubt. Now, who comes to bring doubt inside our heart? The devil will come. He'll bring doubt. No, you don't know this. Uh, you're, you're a believer. See how many mistakes you have made. See how sinful your life is. But here it says, we must understand that the righteousness of God has already been given to us. Right? So we're not doing anything. It's not a place of works. Because we're re receiving it through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Now, just because righteousness has given to us doesn't mean every day we get up, we sin, and in the night you go back, pray, and say, thank you for forgiving me. That's not what it is. Right? We must understand that, hey, if I'm God is calling me righteous, God is calling me holy, I should walk that way. 
Remember the story of a, of the slum boy and the boy when the king took him to the palace. If he still behaves like the slum boy, what will the king say? Hey, I brought you to the palace. The food is yours only. Don't grab all the food and eat it. It's it's your food. It's your house, right? So just because the righteousness of God is in us, doesn't mean we take it for granted, right? We have to learn to live in holiness, right? And uh, we have become the righteousness of God because of what? Because of what Christ did for us. Right? I've used this example before. You got the Father, you got the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven, right? Now the Father is there, the Son is there, and every time we get into God's presence, Right. Are we sinful? Yes. But every time we get into God's presence, we are not coming by our own works. If I come into God's presence saying, God, I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring a church for so many years. Please answer my prayer. What is the problem there? What is the problem? I'm coming by works. Because I'm saying I'm a pastor. God doesn't care whether I'm a pastor, apostle, all that. Even a child of God who is, you know, one month in the Lord, God will answer. God will accept. So I should never come into God's presence saying, Oh God, I'm a Bible college student. Please answer my prayer. You're not coming to God's presence because you're a Bible. What happens after you graduate? God, I am working in the, I am in full-time ministry. Please answer my prayers. No. Right? We don't come into God's presence by all of that. We come by faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am a sinner. I know that some things that I've thought, some things that I've said is sinful, is wrong. Some things that I've seen is wrong. But Lord, I'm coming into your presence because your word says, that I can come with confidence. And I'm coming because I know that the blood of Jesus will forgive my sins. Now what is the difference? I'm not coming by my work. I'm not saying, God, I, I'm 10 years in ministry, 20 years in ministry. But I'm saying, God, I'm a sinner. I'm coming through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the difference. So then, if you're coming through the blood of Jesus Christ, there should not be any... You know, any hesitance to come in. God, I know you will answer my prayer. I know you will forgive me. Right? How do you know your sins are forgiven? Does God write one letter and one stamp and say, you are, take, you are forgiven? Does he do that? No. Nothing. You only know in your spirit. By faith, you know that God has forgiven my sins. That's it. The angel of God won't come down and say, okay, your sins are forgiven, my child. No. All the, the, the message of the gospel is only faith in Jesus Christ. It's only faith. Right? In everything that we do, it's faith. How do you know you're justified? How do you know you're sanctified? How do you know there's heaven? How do you know there's hell? How do you know? You read it in the Bible, okay. But do you have faith in the Bible? You can read hundreds of other things, but you have to have faith in it. Right? People come and say, hey, there's no heaven, hell. You know, this world only, the earth only is hell. Everything will go, it will become hell. What will you say? Really? But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, what will you say? Hey, no, this is what God's word is saying. God himself said there's heaven, there's hell. And one day we will pass away and there is an afterlife. So I believe in this. People make fun. Hey, you're mad. How can you believe in this? No, I have faith. Simple. Nobody can change that faith. Remember in the New Testament, in Jesus' ministry, he healed a blind man. What that blind man did? He went telling everyone. Everyone said, who healed you? Jesus of Nazareth healed me. Okay, don't tell anybody. This man went and told everyone, no, Jesus healed me. Then the, uh, he went to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They started asking, 
who healed you? I said, Jesus of Nazareth. No, no, you are not blind. What, is it? what does he say? See, I don't know all of that. One thing I know, I was blind. Now I see. Secondly, I, I know that Jesus came, he prayed for me, and he healed me. Now, whether he's Messiah, whether he's going to be, uh, you know, the Messiah of the Jews or whatever, that I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, I see now. Jesus came and prayed. Nothing can change that. That is called childlike faith. And that's what God wants from us to believe. Childlike faith. Right? So let's go to chapter 26. We are justified and righteous through faith. We've read this verse, but let's read Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Right. Thank you. So we see here, we have been justified by faith and now we have peace with God. Now this word is very important. Peace with God. What is peace? What is peace? Peace is, there are two kinds of peace. One is an outward peace and one is an inward peace. Yes? Imagine, you know, I, I, I stay in, in my house, I've got two small kids. When you go home, there's only sound. Right? Because they are playing, they are shouting, they are screaming. That's what children will do. Right? So outwardly, too much of sound. But inward peace is different, right? So imagine this: you, if if a Christian family, right, they they lost a loved one, their father or their mother passed away, died, so hurtful, painful, right? Now after some time, there's a peace. Okay, he's in God's presence, or she's in God's presence. Why? Because the Bible says that there's a peace. Who gives that peace? God gives that peace. It's not human peace. Humans can give a certain kind of comfort. Okay, don't worry. We are there for you. But the peace that God gives is passing all understanding. We may not understand, but he gives a peace. For example, you're sitting on the beach. How many of you have seen a beach? Right? You've gone to the beach. You see the beach and you're seeing a beautiful sunset. Ah, so peaceful. That is outward peace. Once you start driving back to the city, it's full of traffic. Where is the peace gone? It's gone. Right? Full traffic. Hey, everyone is shouting at each other. Peace is gone. But the peace that God gives us, whether there is traffic or no traffic, there's peace inside us. So here, God is referring to a peace that is inward. When we, we were in sin in the Old Testament. There was God and man, it was separate because of sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, he made peace between God and man. It was like Jesus took his blood, went to heaven and said, Okay, God, I know you are holy. And now because you are holy, people are sinful. But now I've taken up all the sins of the world on the cross. So with this blood, you make peace. You'll be peaceful. You as a God and my children, your children, those who believe in, this, in the blood of Jesus are peaceful. So there's no enmity. God is not saying, I'm still angry. I'm still, you know, I'm going to bring punishment upon you. No, there's peace. It has been restored. You get what I'm saying? Right? We now have peace with God. We have access to God. We stand in a place of grace before the Father. And we have the full joy because of hope of the glory of God. One day, we have this hope that one day when we pass away, when we die, we will go and be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Is that a hopeful thing or is that a sad thing? It's hope. 
So when we are living our life, we can live with joy, live with confidence, knowing that one day we will be with the Lord Jesus. All that we are studying about Jesus, all the scriptures, the prayer, the worship, all that we did in our life, you know, the worship, prayer, asking God, speak to me. Now, after we pass away, the hope is that we will be with Jesus. Now, when you're in heaven, you don't need to pray. Right? Only worship will happen there. No need prayer points. No prayer points. You're in God's presence. Right? And that's the hope that you and I have. Let's read uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Philippians 3. Eight, eight, nine. Nine. Yes, please go ahead, Gertrude. Philippians 3, verses 8 to 9. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And he found in him, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but the but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Yes. So here, it's very interesting, this passage. Paul is writing to the believers in Philippi. Now in Philippi, the, the believers are being persecuted. Right? They're going through persecution. And he's saying, now all that I am going through, right? all the good things that I've done, all the challenging things that I've gone through, all the difficult seasons. One is we started good many churches. I wrote many epistles. Then he says, okay, I, I was beaten. I was shipwrecked. So many things happened to me. But I am not going to into God's presence with all that list. He says here, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Right? for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish because so that I may gain Christ. So Paul is saying, he's not saying that the things that he has done is rubbish, but he's saying if you compare them to Jesus, Jesus is much greater. Knowing Jesus is bigger. Now, this is a very important lesson that you and I must learn. Sometimes in ministry, we may fall in love with the ministry. Yes, I like to do ministry. I like to worship. I like to sing songs. But we forget why are we doing it? Are you getting what I'm saying? Right? Yes, ministry. Is, sometimes we like to do ministry. Oh, I like to pray for people. I like to you know minister to people. I like to preach. I like to study the word. I like, I like to prepare sermons. It's good. But if I'm doing all this and I'm not gaining knowledge about Christ or I'm not going closer to Jesus, it's a failure. So Paul is saying, I count all of this rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Compared to knowing Jesus, Jesus is much greater than all that I have done. So very important for us. Don't get caught up into doing ministry and forget to spend time in God's presence. And Jesus says, you, you, you must, I am the vine, you are the branches. Unless you abide in me, you will not bear fruit. Yes? So sometimes we can abide in the ministry. We can rest in the ministry. Oh, I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. I can rest there. But that's the wrong place to be. I should rest in God's presence. I should rest with Jesus. And out of that will come everything else. Right? You get what I'm saying? Yes. So that's very important. We are justified and righteous through faith. Never take your commitments or your achievements and go to God's presence. Never take Things that you know, maybe even your um, you know failures. Yes, don't don't carry them and say, God, these are all my failures. Yes, it's good to humble ourselves, but God is saying, Hey, move on. 
Go on. I have better things for you. Don't sit and think about all the failures. Rise up again. Stand up. Know your identity. Now, for example, an eagle is flying and it hits a something on the way and falls down. Do you think it'll be down itself or do you think it'll get up and fly again? It'll try again. Look at athletes. I've seen these videos which people send, right? Especially these runners and all. Right. Somebody had sent me this clip of how this, it was a 400 meters race. No, I think it was the Olympics. 400 meter race. And it was the women's 400 meters. And this girl, the, one of the uh, participants, she was running. And in the middle, she tripped with her own feet and fell down. Everyone have gone. Uh, two options. Get up and go and sit. Because there's no chance. How will she win? But she got up and started running. Right? And she finished the race and she came second. She overtook everyone. Now, in the natural, if we are so determined, right? how much more must we be in the spiritual, in the things of God? Right? So remember that the enemy will come. He will confuse us, say you are not righteous, you are not this, you are not that. He will also come to a place to say that Jesus himself is not there. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. What is the word? Uh, what is what is the number one thing that the Satan uses? Lies. Lies and deception. Now, to you and I as believers, Satan won't come and say there is no Jesus. We know, hey, there is Jesus. I may not be, uh, you know, very holy, but I know there is Jesus died on the cross. That much I know. So he'll come in different ways. You're reading the word, he'll say, uh, and the word says you're righteous before God. That means you're not a sinner. The devil will say, no, how is that possible? You are a sinner. You sin, no? Yesterday only you, you sin. Should I remind you which sin you did? He'll remind you also. He's a master in that. So what should you do? You should be smart enough. You should say, no need to remind me, I know it. So I'm not going to have to give an account to you. We are giving an account to who? Jesus. I don't have to give an account to the devil. There are mistakes we make. The devil will come and say, you did this. I say, I always say this. I say, I don't have to tell you anything. I made mistakes, yes. But I don't have to tell you. Who are you? Why should I tell you? You are reminding me of my mistakes. So why should I have a conversation with you? I can always go to Jesus who will forgive me. You are not going to forgive me anyways. There's no way that you can. So I might as well go to Jesus. Simple. Right? So understand. Know it inside your heart. You know that you are a child of God. Righteous and justified. Everyone with me? Yes? Okay. Chapter 27. Let's go. Justified and righteous freely by his grace. Romans 3.24. Oh, let's let's actually we've already read that, but let's read Titus three, four through seven. Titus chapter three, four to seven. Yes, go ahead. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward men appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he pure, poured out of on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace we shall become his according to the hope of eternal life. Yes. So now, again, Paul is writing here. Now, it's interesting. You and I are justified by grace. 
Now, remember the example I gave you about grace? What is grace? You should know this. Grace is something we don't deserve. Unmerited favor. Remember the uh, teacher gives you 39? 40 is the pass mark. What will you do? Sir, one mark. You see somewhere one mark. Do you deserve it? No. Will he give it? Depends on the teacher's heart. I will give you. Right? That's called grace. Now we are justified and righteous by grace through Jesus Christ. It is God's grace. I cannot say, oh, thank God I, you know, somebody told me about Jesus. Thank God I agreed. You agreed. But who did the work? You agreed to become believe in Jesus, but that doesn't make you the great one or me the great one. The work was already done by Jesus. It is his grace that he is allowing us into his kingdom, that he is forgiving us. So nowadays, there can be many teachings right, where this religious mindset, where you have to come into God's presence through you know, the sacrifices that you have made or how holy you have lived your life or how much of the Bible that you know or how many gifts of the spirit you have, right? How are you, uh, do you have prophecy? Are you an apostle? Are you a prophet? Are you a teacher? And then we think there are different levels for each place. That is not so. Now think about this. There can be an apostle. Okay. Say, okay, apostle Paul. Was he a great man? Apostle Paul? In the New Testament, he did so much. Because of him, we have the entire three-fourths of the New Testament. He did great things for God's kingdom. Now, Apostle Paul is there. And one believer who is one month, right? For example, he believed in Jesus just one month. Something happened and he passed away. Now, both are in heaven. Okay. Apostle Paul is there and this believer is also there one month in the Lord. He doesn't know anything from the Bible. Nothing. He doesn't know Apostle Paul also. So he's standing there. Now when God sees both of them, how will he see them? You tell me. Will God see them equal? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because Apostle Paul is coming through faith in Jesus Christ, this believer who's one month in the Lord is coming through faith in Jesus Christ. So when God is saying, hey, both of them are my children. But we also know that God is a just God. Yes? Apostle Paul, he sacrificed so much. So he, he did so much for God's kingdom. He planted churches. All of that is there. So he will be rewarded accordingly to what he has done. This person may not have done much, right? He will be rewarded for his life for what he has done. But the grace is the same. When God looks at both of them, they both are equal. Both are saved by grace. Paul, Apostle Paul is not saved by uh, writing letters. Nor this young man is saved by any of his works. You get what I'm saying? You're understanding, right? Both are the same in God's eyes. That is the grace of God. Right? So it's not merit-based. None of us can go to God's presence by works. Thank God. You know, today I prayed one hour. Can you please speak to me? Oh, God, I prayed for two hours today. Can you give me a good job? It's not how it works. Yes, we have to pray, we have to ask God, but you don't say, okay, because I prayed, God will give me. Even if you don't pray, God gives you. That's his grace. Right? So, this is the blessings that we have. All we have to do is receive this free gift of grace. So Jesus is saying, my grace is upon you. Take it. All we are doing is, thank you, Jesus. How many of you know that tomorrow you will wake up in the morning? 
They don't know. Okay, I'm not making you scared. Don't get scared. But we don't know, no? We really don't know. Right? Every morning when we open our eyes, it is the grace of God. Nothing. It's not because we went to the gym or because we had uh, good food. All of that is good. It's important to keep our bodies, look after our body. Very important. But if you go extreme, you know, these people who go to the gym and they're only living inside the gym the whole day, right? And they only want to do exercise. Right? Their whole life is based on that. Right now, it's good to look after your body. It's good to be strong and healthy, eat healthy. But if you feel that, oh, because I've done this, that's why I'm so strong. They don't know tomorrow whether they live or no. It is the grace of God. Everyone say grace of God. If you have gifts and talents that God has given you, some of you can sing, some of you can dance, some of you can write. It is the grace of God. Who gave it to you? Did you pay for it? Oh, I can sing. I actually paid uh, you know, $1 million to sing. It's a grace. It's a gift of God given to us. So remember that this amazing grace that God has given us, we take it very lightly. Yes? Do we think about it? There are, you know, I always tell my kids, you know, sometimes they go to school and they don't eat their lunch. They come back, the lunch box is just like that. What do I say? So I sit with them and I say, see, there are children around who don't have food, who are hungry, right? And who don't have anything. But you have some good food. Why don't you eat? I began to talk to them about grace. And they understand it. Why? Because grace is something we take very lightly. How many people around us don't have homes, don't have eyes to see, don't have legs to walk? It's very sad, right? It's the grace of God that we are here, healthy, strong. God has given us everything that we have. Yes or no? Imagine living as a blind person. Is it nice? But even through that, God, you know, how many of you know Fanny Crosby? She's an old hymn writer. She wrote 8,000 hymns. 8, 000, how many of you have heard Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine? It's an old hymn. 8,000 hymns. She's a blind girl. That's the grace of God. So don't take the grace of God lightly. Don't feel, ah, God. It's there, it has to be there. No. This life we have is a gift from God. You need to honor it. Right? So let's go to chapter 28. We've already read this verse, Romans 3, 24 and 25. Uh, justified and righteous through his blood. Okay, Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we, have, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Right? Colossians 1, 20 and 21. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether the things on earth or things in heaven, heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Right now, here's a, an important point here. We are reconciled by grace. First is reconciled by faith, then grace. Now we are reconciled how? By the blood of Jesus. Now picture this. Jesus died on the cross. In the Old Testament, the high priest would take the blood of the lamp, right? And he would sprinkle it on the altar. And what would that do? This blood of the lamb will co cover the sins. So that means God is, for example, this is, you know, there's, there's something here. It's a sin. God is covering it. Okay, I'm not seeing it. It's covered. That's what happened in the Old Testament. The blood of the lamb, one goat, 
right? Without blemish. The Old Testament, it is poured on the sacrifice. Now, on the in the New Testament, Jesus shed his own blood. And the book of Hebrews talks about it. He took his blood and presented it to the Father. That through his blood, once for all, what was done in the Old Testament was doing every year. Every year, the high priest would pour the blood over the altar. Okay, God has so, covered our sins. But now when Jesus, the great high priest, goes into heaven, he showed his own blood. He sprinkled his own blood in the altar in heaven. And now the price has been paid. It is finished. The blood of Jesus is powerful even now. Uh, you tell some of the unbelievers, people from other faiths, the blood of Jesus, they'll say, hey, what is this? The blood of Jesus 2000, what, 2020 years ago was gone. It was all over, out of his body, the blood. Right? How do we know when the Romans pierced his side, what happened? Water came. No more blood, zero blood. The Lord Jesus shed every drop of his blood. Now that blood is precious blood. And through the blood of Jesus, we find forgiveness of sins. Through the blood of Jesus, we have been made righteous and justified. When we partake in the Lord's table, the body and the blood of Jesus, right? what are we saying? That blood is able to forgive our sins because the price has been paid. The blood of Jesus is powerful. When we pray, you know, sometimes I cover them with the blood of Jesus. I, I, I speak the blood of Jesus over your family. Right? You're healed by the blood of Jesus. Why do we say these things? Because his blood is still speaking. His blood is powerful. His work that he has done is so powerful. The moment you and I know the power of the blood of Jesus, no devil can come against it. No devil can come against the blood of Jesus. No, impossible. The devil and his demons cannot penetrate through the blood of Jesus. It's like a fire. They cannot do anything. It's covered. It's sealed. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. And you and I, when we as believers go to Je go to his presence the blood of jesus speaks it's like the blood is saying i have paid the price and i'm willing to forgive your sins what must we do only believe have faith right there are some practical implications on page 36 Practical implications of being justified and made righteous. Right? So, what effect does being justified and righteous have for us as believers? Just because we are justified, just because we are righteous, what is it that happens to us? Just, oh, I think there are five points there. Let's look at that. There is no condemnation. So, we live free of guilt, shame, accusation. Two, we have boldness to enter into the presence of God, to continue to walk in intimate relationship with God. Three, we reign in life. That means we have dominion and power over the work of the devil and his demons. We have dominion over Satan, dominion over sin. We have authority. Four, we confront Satan as king and master over him and his demons. That means when the devil comes with temptations, don't be scared and go, you know, we are not called to be scared and go sit in the side. Oh, devil is coming. What do I do? No. God has given us the authority and he's saying, you are masters over the devil. The Bible says he destroyed the devil. He crushed the serpent's head. He's defeated. So you and I must walk in that victory, right? And finally, we must be, we are careful to maintain continual fellowship with the Lord by abiding in a place of 
righteousness. The devil will come and say, gone for you. Nobody will listen to you. You've done the worst sin possible. You say, yes, I have sinned. Instead of running away from God, you and I can run to God. Go back to God and say, Jesus, I've done this terrible sin. Is there any sin the blood of Jesus cannot forgive? Right? So just go back to him. Run back to him. Restore your identity. Right? Remember, in life, in this life, Christian walk, there will be ups and downs. There will be times we will be victorious. There will be times we will fail. But when we fail, don't go to a place of saying, oh, you know, I'm not good enough. No. If we do that, we are making the blood of Jesus or the cross powerless. Because in the spiritual, it's, it's always powerful. But we're, we're not, we are saying that that was not enough. Was the cross enough or not enough? Does Jesus have to come again and die? Does he have to come again and do some work? Do some more healings, miracles? No. It's enough. It's done. The work was finished. He said, it is finished. It's done. So you and I must stand in that identity. Right? So we'll stop here. We'll pick up from next class on no condemnation. But here's the thing I want each one of us to do. Uh, even the students online, you can do this. Those who are uh, mostly Hindi speaking, so I want you to write down these words, right? Sanctification. Even those who are, uh, you know, English speaking, you can do that, right? Write down these words: sanctification, justification, redemption, right? These important words: righteousness of God, justified. Write it down and write down the meaning of that word. Okay? Can you do that? Right? Those who are online as well can do it even I will do this right so this is my homework so I will write down righteousness justification redemption there are so many other words right that we gave, that we've seen right uh, justified righteous uh, righteous by grace uh, justified by grace so write down these verses sorry these words and the meaning of that verse you can write it in any book and keep speaking it keep declaring it over your life so by the end of this course, or at least in the, by the next month, if I ask you what is righteousness, you should know. Hey, this is what I am. Right? So will you do that? Right? So just write it down and keep reading it. Maybe every day, just maybe two times, once in the morning, once in the night. Right? Just read all those words. Uh, so then you'll know, OK, this is what the meaning of those words are. Right? All right, so we'll stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. I'll see you in the next class. Thank you to the online students as well. God bless. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. God bless.